Let's discuss the knee joint. Now the knee joint is a really interesting articulation of the body. The knee joint consists of three bones, the femur, the patella, and the tibia. Now where the femur meets the tibia, this is known as the femorotibial joint. An interesting point to make here that is not often discussed in anatomy class is that the patella does not articulate with the tibia. It only articulates with the femur. So let's start our discussion now with the distal femur. Now let's talk about the shape of the distal femur. The shaft of the femur, the distal shaft of the femur, is triangular in cross-section. Now you can really see this from the posterior angle here. Two ridges kind of coming up like this. If you were to cut through, it would look like a triangle in cross-section. Now, at the distal end of the femur, we're going to turn it around, you can see that the shape of the distal end of the femur here is more square in appearance. And looking at it, it looks similar to the base of a pyramid. Now the proximal end of the tibia down here is also in the shape of a pyramid, but an upside down pyramid in this case. If we look at the base of the distal femur here, we can see that the articular surfaces are quite round and they roughly uh, resemble the shape of a pulley. The anterior portion of the distal femur is called the intercondylar fossa of the femur. Now this area here articulates with the patella, as you can see. The single tract pulley becomes a double tract in the posterior inferior aspect. Now these tracts are the medial and lateral condyles of the femur, which articulate with the condyles of the tibia. Let's look at the proximal tibia. This being the proximal tibia, and here is the distal femur. Now, the superior surface of the tibia is called the tibia plateau. The lateral and medial condyles of the tibia are concave in shape for their articulation with the convex condyles of the femur. To demonstrate, Note how the convex condyles of the distal femur glide across the concave uh, condyles of the proximal tibia. I'd like to point out some important landmarks on the tibia. There's a lateral area on the surface of the tibial plateau here, known as Gerdes tubercle, and that's where the IT band inserts. There's also a prominence on the anterior surface of the uh, proximal tibia called the anterior tibial tuberosity. Now this would be where the quadriceps muscle inserts. And at the center of the tibia plateau here, the edges of the condyles are raised and form a structure called the intercondylar eminence. Now let's talk about the patella. Now, this blue object here would be the patella and its surface here is covered in articular cartilage which will help it to glide. Its main function is to protect the quadriceps tendon here and the patella is actually embedded within the tendon and during motion this tendon would glide and slide through a groove. This being the groove here on the patellar surface of the femur, the distal femur, which is also covered in articular cartilage which will reduce friction and allow the two bony surfaces to glide uh, nicely in relation to each other. So let's demonstrate that. So as you can see, it would glide back and forth through the groove, acting like a pulley as it protects the tendon. The patella is a sesamoid bone. There are two articular facets on the posterior surface of the patella, as you can see here and here, and they are separated by a vertical ridge right in the middle. Now, the posterior surface of the patella articulates with the patellar surface of the femur. So we'll open up the joint here, this area in here being the patellar surface of the femur. Now, the patella is attached to the meniscus. You'd have the lateral meniscus here and the medial meniscus on the opposite side. And it's attached to the meniscus via the meniscopatellar ligaments. So on the lateral side, we'll just turn the model slightly, 
the ligament would run from the lateral meniscus up into the patella, and from the medial side, it would run from the medial meniscus up into the patella as well. Now, even though it is attached, the patella does remain quite mobile. The next thing we're going to discuss is the menisci of the knee. So let's just open up the joint here and take a look inside so we can actually see the menisci. Now, the menisci are crescent shaped, or croissant shaped, interarticular discs made of fibrocartilage. The tips of the menisci are attached to the intercondylar eminence, so the center part here of the tibia. The thicker outer margins are attached to the peripheral edges of the medial and lateral tibial condyles. There are also several interesting attachment sites to nearby structures I'd like to mention when we start talking about the meniscus. Now, as you see from the outside here, we have the lateral meniscus and the medial meniscus. There are actually the ligaments that attach from the menisci to the patella, and these are called the meniscal patellar ligaments. Now, if we look at a ligament on the side called the medial collateral ligament, it's this one, if I turn it here just on the side here, there's actually a section there that attaches right on to the menisci. Now, if I turn it around posterior, there's a muscle that crosses over the back called the popliteus that attaches onto the menisci, and also a hamstring muscle called the semimembranosus that attaches on to the medial meniscus. If we're speaking about meniscal functions, we should definitely talk about several things. One is they increase the distribution of synovial fluid. There's a capsule that surrounds the entire knee that the menisci are on and the synovial fluid acts as a lubricant for better gliding over one surface. The menisci inside here also acts act to act for uh, shock absorption. They increase the weight-bearing surface which results in better distribution of pressure. And you'll also know how it kind of caves in here a bit. So they act as wedges which increase the concave shape of the tibial condyles which helps to provide better stability. So, both the medial and the lateral menisci have several functions. Let's talk a little bit about menisci motion. During knee extension, this would be knee flexion, knee extension. During extension, the menisci move forward, being pushed forward by the femoral condyles. So, if we actually turn this around here, and we'll see the femoral condyles on each side here, we'll see that it's, the menisci are being pushed forward and also being pulled forward by the meniscal patellar ligaments. So the meniscal patellar ligaments are on each side here, and so if we're straightening out the leg here, the menisci are being pushed forward by the femoral condyles and being pulled forward by the meniscal patellar ligaments which attach on each side here. Now let's talk about menisci motion during knee flexion. During flexion, the menisci move backwards pushed by the condyles of the femur. So again, the condyles of the femur are here and here, and they are going to be pushing the menisci backwards. They're going to be pushed backwards by the tendons also of the posterior muscles, the popliteus, which runs in the back here, and one of the hamstrings, the semimembranosus muscle, and the medial collateral ligament on the side here. So we've got several structures here that are actually going to be involved in knee flexion, pushing the menisci back popliteus and semimembranosus muscles, and the medial collateral ligament. The next aspect is talking about meniscal motion during knee rotation. So if we're either talking about medial or lateral rotation of the knee, we'll find that the menisci on the same side, or what they call ipsilateral menisci, moves forward due to pressure from the condyle. So if we're going into medial rotation, we'll find that the medial meniscus will actually move forward, and if we're going into lateral rotation, then the lateral meniscus will actually move forward. Fairly straightforward. The knee is surrounded by a thick capsule that attaches just outside the articular surfaces of the femur, patella, and tibia. Think of it as my hands here. They're encompassing and surrounding everything in and around the joint. Now, the patella itself, in this area here, 
is contained within the anterior portion of the capsule. The synovial fluid that circulates throughout the knee circulates within the capsule. Now, the anterior portion of the capsule is quite slack, and this allows for good range of motion and knee flexion. So as we bend the knee here, this would be knee flexion. During extension though, as we come back and straighten out the leg, the capsule forms deep folds on either side. The patella is attached to the femoral condyles and the menisci by small ligaments that would run here and here. Now these ligaments are actually thickenings of the capsule. The knee capsule is thicker posteriorly, so let's turn this around and look at it from the back. And it forms strong bands that connect the femoral and tibial condyles. Now these bands resist hyperextension, so first let's put the knee into flexion. As we come back and straighten the leg into extension, these bands running here and here would provide a passive stability in the standing position. Now let's talk about the ligaments of the knee. Ligaments of the knee are essential for stability. Let's look at the patellar ligament. Now the ligament is contained within the patellar tendon and it attaches the patella, which you can see here embedded in the tendon, to the tibia and it inserts on the tibial tuberosity. So if we bend this back, you can see the tibial tuberosity where the patellar ligament would insert. Now, this ligament can be viewed as a continuation of the tendon of the quadriceps muscle whose fibers cross over each other at the knee. Now let's discuss the cruciate ligaments. The knee joint is held in place by two cruciate ligaments, the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. Now these ligaments are located in the intercondylar fossa of the femur. So we'll just open the model up as we flex. So this would be the intercondylar fossa of the femur. And the primary role of these ligaments is to prevent anterior and posterior displacement of the femur and tibia. These two ligaments are named according to where they attach on the tibia. Structurally, they're outside the joint capsule. Now, the anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, is attached to the intercondylar area of the tibia, the anterior intercondylar area of the tibia. So that would be right in here. It runs posterior laterally, so in this direction, and attaches to the medial aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. This would be the lateral femoral condyle, and it would attach to the medial aspect. Now, the anterior cruciate ligament tends to resist anterior displacement of the tibia on the femur. So it would resist anterior movement of the tibia here on the femur. Now let's talk about the posterior cruciate ligament, or PCL. Now the PCL attaches to the posterior intercondylar area of the tibia, which would be right here and it runs anterior superior medially, which would be this direction, like that, attaching to the lateral surface of the medial femoral condyle. So we're going to spin this around so you can see that attachment. We're going to open up the joint, and as you can see, the PCL attaches running up in this direction right here, which would be the medial femoral condyle and the lateral surface of that medial femoral condyle. Now, if we spin this back around from a posterior view, the PCL, the posterior cruciate ligament, resists posterior displacement of the tibia on the femur. So it resists movement of the tibia in a posterior direction. Now, as a side note for the anatomy nerds, there's a ligament that often isn't discussed in anatomy, and that would be the posterior meniscofemoral ligament, which is this ligament here. And the significance of this is that it attaches directly into the posterior aspect of the lateral meniscus. Now let's discuss the two collateral ligaments of the knee. The medial or tibial collateral ligament and the lateral or fibular collateral ligament. 
The medial or tibial collateral ligament runs from the medial condyle of the femur to the medial condyle and upper medial shaft of the tibia, here. Now the ligament stabilizes the joint and prevents it from opening on the medial side. If this ligament is ruptured, the tibia here will be able to move laterally in that direction. The lateral or fibular collateral ligament runs from the lateral condyle of the femur to the head of the fibula. Now, the primary function of the ligament is to prevent the knee joint from opening on the lateral side. If this ligament is ruptured, then the tibia here would be able to move medially. Now, an interesting point about the collateral ligaments is that they tend to be taut in extension and slack in flexion. To illustrate this, let's look at the lateral or fibular collateral ligament. As we flex the knee, you can see that the ligament becomes slack. And as we move into extension, it becomes taut. Now, the fact that they're taut in extension helps to resist hyperextension, preventing hyperextension knee injuries.